Let's bring in Chris Mannix, senior writer, Sports Illustrated. Uh, you tell me, I mean, it, it doesn't feel like a run it back roster. They also have the kid they drafted from Santa Clara Pods, who's got tons of energy. He's not quite the refined product, but he's a good, good player, high energy, great motor. Your takeaway on Clay Thompson, what happens? Yeah, it does not look like a run it back roster because even though this team went 27 and 12 down the stretch, they still finished as the 10th seed and got creamed by a Kings team without Malik Monk and without Kevin Herter. So the facts kind of speak for themselves. Now, I talked to a couple of team executives this morning about what they would offer Clay Thompson in free agency, and their guess was somewhere between 20 and $25 million per year over a two or a three year deal. They also guessed that Clay Thompson is going to be looking for significant more, significantly more in that deal. So there's going to have to be a reckoning, I think, in that Golden State front office. Joe Lacob, the owner, has made it clear he wants to take this team under the luxury tax next season. They spent $380 million on salaries and tax penalties this year. He wants to get them under the tax that next season. That can begin with excising Chris Paul from the roster, but it's going to lead to a hard conversation with Clay Thompson where they say to him, we think you're worth X. If you think you're worth Y, go out there and see if it's out there for you. Yeah, I get that. Um, you know, we were talking about, I, I threw out my scenario. The Clippers unravel against the Mavericks, and Paul George is like, I'm a California guy. I don't want to leave the state, but I'm, I'm over this. I'm over Harden. I'm over Kawhi. And then he moves up north, and then you can keep a lot of your Moses Moody, Kaminga, and frankly, you give LeBron a call because Steph's timeline is probably three more great years. But I do think Paul George is somebody – I mean, he, he chose California – is that crazy to think? Because if you do that with Paul George and you move off Chris Paul, you could keep a lot of the parts. Otherwise, what would they do? It, it, look, I, I, I don't know if the audience wants to be bored with salary cap machinations <laughs> and exactly why things will or won't work because of the first apron and the second apron. Just to say, uh, it would be exceedingly difficult, if not impossible, for the Warriors to pull off a deal that – brings Paul George to Golden State. It would have to be presumably a sign and trade deal. Maybe Paul George opts into his contract. There's just a lot of obstacles standing in the way of Golden State, which is what makes this situation that they're in so problematic. I mean, they can rely on some organic growth next year. I think Kaminga is a star in waiting. I think he's yeah. going to become an even better player next season. You mentioned, you know, Brandon Pozinski. He is someone that's going to get better in a more enhanced role. So even if Clay Thompson leaves as a free agent, they can fill in some of those voids with the players that they already have. But Colin, we're talking about a team that has made championships the bar, four championships during this era. There really is no scenario where you can look at this Warriors team and say a tweak there, a twist there, and they are a championship contender. That's why I think this offseason is going to lead to some very hard conversation that Warriors front office about where this team goes from here. So LeBron is 12 and 0 in his last 12, like game sevens, playing games, uh, in season tournament. He in this roster, I said before, is that if they were a band, they could give you a great performance. But they're not a world tour band. They're just LeBron's old and AD's older than his age, and they don't have a lot of dependable parts. But you could get one great night out of them. I think they match up pretty well with Denver. Don't think they'll beat them. Probably get beaten five. What transpires, in your opinion, in that series? Oh, well, Colin, I'm sitting here in Nick Wright's chair in New York City, so I feel like I should be infused with LeBron and Lakers optimism, but I'm just not right now. I mean, you look at the most recent history, a four-game sweep in the conference finals last year. The Nuggets went 3-0 and against the Lakers this season. Yes, the margin of victory in those games was very tight. The Lakers were not blown out in, in many of them. So you have some reason to believe they'll be competitive in this series. But I'm sure there's an argument to be made that catching the Nuggets early might be better for them than catching them late. But you can also make the argument that the Nuggets are not exactly sleepwalking into the postseason. They won six of their last eight games. And despite some of the adversity that they faced during this regular season, they still finish in a statistical tie with Oklahoma City for the best record in a competitive Western Conference. So you really got to squint to look for the Lakers' pathway to victory. But I'll do it for you if you want. The pathway to victory 
Is D'Angelo Russell playing out of his mind? D'Angelo Russell, after the All-Star break, averaged about 20 points per game, shot 41% from three. Those are excellent numbers. You saw him down the stretch against the Pelicans last night making a key three-pointer. They need the D'Angelo Russell that played the second half of this season, played in the play, and has played in for a lot of his time with the Lakers to show up in this series and not be the D'Angelo Russell that was virtually unplayable yeah. in that series against Denver. The Nuggets just played D'Angelo Russell right off the floor. And if he is that same player, this series is going to be over very quickly. So let's go to the East. Miami and Philly play. Uh, Boston will be favored over both. But I, I would rather face... Philly, even though I'd have to face Embiid, uh, I don't want to face Spolstra, Butler. I, I just, I'd like to get out of that. There are these weird teams in sports that just rise, and they're just a pain. I don't want to face Spolstra, Jimmy, bam, I, I don't want to. But as somebody that covers the Celtics, are either of those teams capable of pushing Boston and making them a little uncomfortable? Yeah, I think Miami is the team the Celtics would most likely like to avoid, even though the Heat are probably a weaker version of the team we yeah. saw last year. Yeah. They're still Miami. They're still brilliantly coached. They've still got a great closer in Jimmy Butler. And Celtics, historically, at least over the last 10 years, have really played well against the 76ers. Al Horford plays really well against Joel Embiid. So that's probably the matchup that they would prefer in the first round. But... Any first-round matchup with the Celtics right now is a little bit concerning because the Celtics, they haven't played, like, a meaningful game since <laughs> Ash Wednesday. I mean, they have been basically just sleepwalking yeah. through the last month, month and a half of the regular season. I was at the game last week against the Knicks, a meaningful game kind of for both teams. The Celtics suited up their stars. The Knicks suited up their best players. The Knicks just kicked the crap out of them. So... The question of whether or not the Celtics are going to be sharp having another week off, having not played meaningful games in a while, going up against the potentially sharp or in focused Miami or Philadelphia team, that is a, a cause for concern early in that series. Watch that game one for the Boston Celtics. If they lose that game, there are going to be some alarm bells going off in Boston. <laughs> so sometimes this happens, Chris, where the, a story is better than a team. And I think that's the Knicks. Uh, Julius Randle gets hurt, more of the offense runs through Brunson, and he's terrific. Uh, he's the best quarterback in New York, including Aaron Rodgers and Daniel Jones. I love him outside of Ewing. I think he's my favorite, you know, Knicks guy since maybe, I don't know, Allen Houston or uh, 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 Walt Frazier, whatever. But I think the story is better than reality. When he's off the floor, it's not a highly functional offense, and I think they're going to get doused in the first round. And then I think they're going to go big game hunting, Carl Anthony Town, something like that. Give me your thoughts on the Knicks, the future, the now. Um, I just, I, I, there's not enough offense here to me to win a playoff series, is there? I think there's enough offense to win uh, a first round series. Is there enough offense to beat a Milwaukee team in the second round? Is there enough offense to beat the Celtics? in the conference finals. That's very much uh, an open question. Look, I had many questions about the Knicks even before this Julius Randle injury because the history of the Knicks stars in the near playoff uh, past has not been very good. Julius Randle has been great during the regular season. The Knicks have made the playoffs. He has been categorically awful in the postseasons. Now, Jalen Brunson wasn't bad in the playoffs last year, but you look at the three-point numbers, he shot better than 40% in the regular season. He was around low 30s uh, during the postseason. That's not going to get it done in a postseason series. So when you go up against teams that have good defensive players and good defensive coaches, and they're able to dig into one team with one really serious option, that's going to make a Knicks deep playoff run, I think, really problematic. All right, you had uh, you're an MVP voter. Uh, I didn't. I, I would go Luka Jokic, SGA, uh, Jalen Brunson, maybe a four. I don't know, but I I could argue both. But I do think Luka really k taking Kyrie to a place LeBron did, where basketball trumps everything. I think it's substantial because I think if you look at LeBron, a, a Kyrie in Boston, Kyrie in Brooklyn, Kyrie pre LeBron in Cleveland. It's not the talent. It's, you know, there's stuff. 
And I think Lucas solved it. And I that to me, if there's a tiebreaker, I think that's substantial. What was your vote? I, I like that normalizing Kyrie is, is, <laughs> is kind of a criteria for for winning uh, MVP. Not, not that I necessarily disagree with it. I mean, it clearly works between Kyrie and Luka Doncic, but um, I, I use other criterias there. I mean, look, it was incredibly close between Jokic, Luka, and SGA, but Shea Gildas-Alexander got my MVP vote this year because, look, he took over and is the leader of the youngest team in the NBA and the youngest team to ever win the number one overall seed. This was a player that last year was on a team that was a lottery team, takes them all the way to the number one seed, put up the kind of statistics offensively that we have not seen since Michael Jordan's best seasons, since Steph Curry's MVP seasons. And one of the more important differentiators that I used for Shea Gildas Alexander is that he is a two-way player. He's top 10, top 12 in defensive win shares. You gotta go a little bit further down to find Nikola Jokic and way further down to find Luka Doncic, who is not a, a better than average defensive player. So all three of these guys put up great numbers, but Shea's team success on a team that was nowhere last year and the fact that I think he's the best two-way player of the bunch, that gave him a slight edge on my ballot. I like it. How about that, J-Mac? I like that. That's it, it, Listen, it's close. It's inches. You can, the argument, value is what are you doing it's not a stat. If it's just scoring, Luka's going to win a lot. So Jokic, I, I would make this argument, Chris, that once you win the championship, it's different. There, you don't have that pressure. Luka still faces that, right? SGA faces that. So Jokic doesn't face that, like, impending pressure. Jason Tatum now faces real pressure. Bro, you got to get to the finals. This team is stacked. So the argument, if you make that argument, it comes down to Luka and SGA. Well, Luka has like a guy that was a hit a bucket at a finals guy in Kyrie. SGA's got Chet Holmgren. I surprised you. So, J-Mac, your reaction to that. That's interesting to me. I, I just don't see how you can put SGA on Luka's level. Um, well, as what? Like you said, Chet Holmgren comes in and they improve by 15, 20 wins. Like, Kyrie Irving was there last year. They're better because Luka is a better defensive player this year. I think Chris would probably is, agree. Is SGA a good defense? Does, does defense matter <laughs> by at all? It does? Yeah, yes, I would say I would say defense matters, you know, significantly. The Thunder, uh, outside of rebounding, they're a near flawless team. And SGA is a big reason for that. I watched a lot of Oklahoma City games this year. SGA is often deployed on one of the better, if not the best, uh, wing player on an opposing team. It helps. He's got Lou Dort there as a great defensive wing as well. But SGA oftentimes plays against top offensive players. He also gets the free throw line an absurd amount. His clutch numbers are ridiculous. Look, yeah. this was the hardest MVP ballot I have filled out in about, you know, 15, 20 years wow. of doing it because all three guys you can make a compelling case for. But I think Shea, again, being the two-way player and having a team that, even by virtue of tiebreaker, was the number one team in the Western Conference, I think that means something. I think winning matters, yeah. and SGA's team won at a high level this year. Yeah, no, I think it's great. It's, a, it's one of the better votes. A lot of international guys and a lot of great players. All of them certainly worthy of it. Chris Mannix, as always, good talking to you, my man. Hi, everybody. It's me, Uncle Colin. Subscribe here to get the latest from the herd, including exclusive behind-the-scenes videos and more, wherever you may be, however you may be watching. Thanks again for making us part of your day.